Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Um, let's start, uh, I would say. Um, my name is Patricia Nobel. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of the European Union Studies Center here at the Graduate Center of the City University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, evening's commemoration of the defeat of European fascism. Uh, we, are have, we are very proud to have on stage this evening three distinguished scholars of 20th century history. Um, Mr. Uh, Ira Katznelson, Professor Ira Katznelson of Columbia University, Stephen Kotkin of Princeton University, and Charles Mayer of Harvard University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This event has had many helpers and supporters. John Torpey, professor in the PhD programs of uh, history and sociology, and the director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies here at the Graduate Center, will moderate our panel. And the European Union Studies Center is very much indebted to him and to the Ralph Bunch Institute for their invaluable help in putting together this outstanding event. Thank you. I also wish to thank our other co-sponsors, the American Council on Germany, the Leon Levy Center for Biography, and the CUNY Academy for the Humanities and Sciences uh, for all their support and contributions. And last but not least, a hearty thank you to the Graduate Center um, and its many supportive staff who are just making things happen. And it is now my very great honor to introduce Frank Hellmann, president of the Otto and Van Walter Foundation, a foundation established to promote diverse humanitarian issues. We are very proud to have the foundation's generous support, which has brought us all together here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Hellman. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, when I was uh, first invited to introduce this event, my thought was that I was probably invited because I'm old enough to remember VE Day, but after reflection, I realized it's more likely my association with Otto Walter and the Otto and Fran Walter Foundation, which, as you may have noticed, is a sponsor of the event, proving once again that it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> Seventy years ago this Friday, on May 8, 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allies unconditionally. The event marked not only the end of the Second World War in Europe, but also the end of a regime which had inflicted untold suffering on the peoples of Europe. For Otto Walter, it presented an opportunity Although the Nazis had first denied him the ability to practice his chosen profession and then driven him with his family from his native land, Otto never looked back. As soon as possible after the end of the war, he set out to reestablish his contacts in Germany with two objectives. The first was to generate business for his accounting firm. The second, and by far the most significant one, was to ensure that the nation of his birth and the nation of his adoption should never again go to war against each other. For his efforts in this last, later in the second cause, he was honored by both nations. Today, Germany's relations with its European neighbors and with the United States are cordial, occasionally even friendly. We do not always agree, but the prospect of settling such conflicts militarily is not only not considered, it's inconceivable. Thanks to the efforts who dreamed, as Otto did, of peace among peoples, we live in a world in which the nations of Europe and North America are at peace with each other. And institutions such as the European Union Studies Center, which Otto supported during his lifetime, contribute to, the, to 
making that peace lasting for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is John Torpy. Uh, as it's been mentioned, I'm a professor in the PhD programs in sociology and history and director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies here at the Graduate Center. Uh, I want to thank, before we get started, uh, Patricia Nove, Dr. Patricia Nove, for her incredible efforts really to make this happen, and the Otto and Fram Walter Foundation for their support. We're gathered this evening to commemorate the defeat 70 years ago of European fascism, a great scourge in human affairs that brought on terrible wars, wars and genocides, destroyed millions of innocent lives, and redrew the map of Europe. Yet it also led to new political and economic arrangements that have undergirded decades of peace and prosperity. The defeat of European fascism was followed by the division of Europe into two blocks, divided by the so-called Iron Curtain and the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Western Europe, as well as the continuation of policies associated with the New Deal that helped transform American life. We've assembled a group of distinguished scholars, as Patricia has already mentioned, um, distinguished historians, really, of the, especially the middle decades of the 20th century in order to address these developments, which have so profoundly shaped the world in which we live. So let me introduce them to you in greater detail now. First, to my immediate left, uh, Ira Katznelson is an Americanist whose work has straddled comparative politics and political theory, uh, as well as political and social history. He returned to Columbia in 1994 uh, having been an assistant and then associate professor from 1969 to 1974. In the interim, he taught at the University of Chicago, chairing its Department of Political Science from 1979 until 1982, and in the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research, where he was dean from 1983 to 1989. He was president of the American uh, Political Science Association for 2005-2006. Previously, he served as president of the Social Science History Association and chair of the Russell Sage Foundation uh, Board of Trustees. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. His most recent books are Fear Itself, The New Deal, and the Origins of Our Time, for which he was awarded the Bancroft Prize in 2014, Liberal Beginnings, Making a Republic for the Moderns with Andreas Kalivas, and When Affirmative Action Was White, An Untold History of Racial Inequality in 20th Century America. He's currently completing a book called Liberal Reason, a collection of his essays on the character of modern social knowledge. In addition to his scholarly activities, Professor Katz Nelson is currently president of the Social Science Research Council. Next, let me introduce Stephen Kotkin uh, on the outside in the other direction. Uh, Stephen Kotkin has been teaching since 1989 in the History Department at Princeton, where he holds a joint appointment in the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs. He's also a research scholar at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Professor Kotkin established the Princeton History Department's Global History Initiative and teaches the graduate seminar on global history since the 1850s. He served on the core editorial committee of the journal World Politics, the flagship journal in comparative politics. He founded and co-edited a book series on Northeast Asia that has published six volumes. From 2003 until 2007, he was a member and then chair of the editorial board at Princeton University Press. From 1996 until 2009, he directed Princeton's program in Russia, Russian and Eurasian studies. He's been vice dean of the Woodrow Wilson School and acting director of the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Currently serves as acting director of what is now Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies at Princeton. His latest book, Stalin, Volume 1, Paradoxes of Power, published by Penguin in 2014, 
was just a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in biography. And finally, in the middle, Charles Mayer is the Leverett Saltonstall Professor of History at Harvard University. From 1991 to mid-2002, he was Crook Foundation Professor of European Studies and served during 1994 to 2001 as director of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies at Harvard. Together with Professor Sven Beckert, he directs the Weatherhead in Initiative on Global History, a program that funds student research and postdoctoral exchanges and holds on an ongoing seminar on topics that span different world regions. Mayer has held fellowships with the National Endowment for the Humanities, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the, Ju the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation when he was concurrently a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center's Center for Scholars. In 2003, he was a recipient of an Alexander von Humboldt uh, Research Prize. His many influential pub publications include Among Empires, <coughs> excuse me, Among Empires, American Ascendancy and Its Predecessors by Harvard University Press in 2006, The Shock of the Global, the 1970s in Perspective, Harvard University Press 2010, and Leviathan 2.0, Inventing Modern Statehood, once again, Harvard University Press 2014. So needless to say, we have a very distinguished uh, group of scholars here who are extremely knowledgeable about this part of uh, recent history. And I have a number of questions that I want to ask them uh, to respond to. Basically, the idea was to have Professor Katz Nelson talk about these, uh, uh, this past from a, the point of view of the United States, Professor Mayer to talk from the point of view of, of what was going on in Western Europe, and Professor Kotkin to talk about uh, the perspective of the, from the Soviet Union. So the first question is a fairly simple and straightforward one. Um, what was the significance of the defeat of Europe, European fascism for the United States, for Western Europe, and for the Soviet Union? And I think Professor Mayer is gonna go first. I think the first thing we have to think is, is to take fascism seriously. Uh, it's, it's, as a formal doctrine or movement, it's, it's, it's over. But uh, it, uh, it is fully one of the major ideological alternatives of the early 20th century. And uh, you know, obviously for Western Europe, its defeat uh, was a tremendous uh, liberation, not least for those living in the fascist regimes I include Nazi Germany as, as, as a major one. Uh, that's sometimes uh, debated. They, it overlapped, certainly. Uh, and it had serious intellectual roots. Uh, it had mo mo French and Italian, as well as German, some national syndicalism, a, a distrust of parliaments, uh, a belief in, in the regenerative capacity, the health uh, hygiene of violence, racist ideology. It drew on the inherent authoritarianism of, uh, of colonialism. And the First World War had made its lessons really plausible. The First World War seemed to indicate that parliaments were talk shops uh, and could not take, can, uh, run a serious nationalist enterprise. And it took men from the trenches and military leaders and uh, decisive uh, people to run, run government. Uh, and it, uh, it, it inculcated sometimes a contempt for life. And the remedy of the arrival of mass politics in the early 20th century, especially in Europe, social democracy, uh, later uh, communism as well, made its remedies seem salutary uh, for, for many. Uh, I, my first course when I was teaching in 1967 was a seminar on fascist movements and extreme right. And I remember talking with a great political scientist, uh, Dieter Schlar, about this. And she said, there's nothing serious about it. You can't read, none of these ideas have any seriousness. But I do think the ideas were serious. They're not ideas. Uh, the ideas of authority and, and, uh, and, and leadership and uh, military virtues, uh, and they, they remained serious. Happily, the Second World War eliminated uh, fascism in Europe for the, uh, as a real political alternative. We have some disquieting, uh, we'll come back to that maybe, you know, movements and tendencies uh, in, in, in Europe today, which are uh, in some sense drawn the same emotions and spirits, but at the moment, there is no fascist regime 
in, in view. Uh, and it, for Western Europe, the defeat of fascism re restored representative government, parliamentary government, as a plausible alternative. It gave the European left a claim on government by virtue of its activity in the resistance. Uh, and the question, uh, so I think this is a, you know, it is a, it is a memorable, it is a memorable occasion. I think Americans, uh, our benefactor said he remembered VE Day. I remember it as a six-year-old VJ Day, and to many Americans, VJ Day was the really end of the war. I mean, after all, there were millions of men set to go to, across the Pacific uh, to, to invade Japan. Uh, but the, uh, the end of the fascist war was, uh, you know, it was, it was really significant. And obviously the Europeans understood that, the British and others, as, as, as their, as their ce central war. So good thing it was defeated, taken to be taken seriously, uh, and, to, be, and to, to look, and to, its ideas, for better or worse, also to be taken seriously. The, the, this monumental moment of the defeat of, uh, of the fascist axis um, and the triumph of the United States and its allies, including the Soviet Union, which we come back to this ironic, um, uh, complicated alliance. Um, this moment should remind us, though, that um, if we were to go back just about 10, 15 years before the end of the Second World War, we would have discovered that although um, the Nazi movement was um, widely loathed and feared in the United States, the Italian fascist movement mm. had rather different standing. Um, uh, Breckinridge Long, the US ambassador um, at the beginning of the Roosevelt administration, adored Mussolini. Um, one of his predecessors wrote the preface to Mussolini's autobiography published in English in 1928. Uh, Charles Marion, great political scientist and uh, first president of the Social Science Research Council, celebrated um, the regime for its, quote, experimental nature, anti-dogmatic temper, and moral elan. Um, uh, <laughs> quite extraordinary. Um, and it was only when um, Mussolini, not even the Ethiopian uh, Abyssinian campaign um, uh, made that regime um, the enemy. Um, indeed, in 1936, the Roosevelt administration sent a study group to Rome to discern how to more efficiently run the executive branch of government. It was only after 38 um, when the, the bonding with Nazism became close, and then, of course, with the Second War itself, that fascism, Nazism, fascism, became a unitary category. And one question I have, which I hope we'll come back to, is whether or not what this panel or this event is calling the defeat of fascism was the defeat of Nazism or the defeat of fascism. Um, there's a sense in which soft versions of authoritarianism in a plethora of ways, think of Peronism as a uh, 1946, Juan Perón is elected president of uh, Argentina. Um, whether or not a, a, a plethora of types of, if not capital F fascist, but um, uh, authoritarian, force-centered, and anti-parliamentary, which is, I think, critical, um, regimes, and not only survived the war, um, but became um, in a context where um, dirty hands, as it were, were necessary to fight the Stalinist um, uh, uh, totalitarian um, uh, option, became allies um, to the liberal West. So I think there's a complicated, I'm raising questions about the very title of the defeat, a singular defeat of um, fascism. For the United States and for the world, I, here I echo uh, Charlie Mayer, the, I think the great triumph um, was a demonstration that a government, a regime, a democracy that was a representative, in a sense, parliamentary democracy, ours is Congress, uh, could in fact 
confront and address the big problems of the day. This was exactly what um, uh, not just the fascist critics, um, but the Bolshevik critics um, had said about liberal democracy, that the great flaw was their uh, parliamentary um, uh, design, which um, defeats ideas of public interest that are big, which divides the people into polarized categories, which allows moneyed interests to have uh, undue influence in politics, and which paralyzes regimes so they can't solve the big problems of the time. The New Deal, not just in the 30s, but during the Second World War, um, I have to say a period throughout in which um, uh, the US Congress often said no to Franklin Roosevelt. It did so with court packing. It did so in dismantling during the war many New Deal agencies um, and the like. Uh, there was no simple New Deal dictatorship. This complex separation of powers regime could mobilize a, a, a fantastic um, military, social, economic, political effort, ideological effort um, to help lead the world uh, to defeat um, the anti, an anti-parliamentary force and thereby showed that liberal parliamentary democracy could in fact not only win but govern. Final thing I wanted to say by way of um, this introductory question about its effects concerns something that might be called the long-term effects of that victory some somewhat ironic long-term effects of the victory on American life and politics. The United States emerged from this war with two lessons learned. First, that a kind of thick, complicated, messy, procedural democracy could galvanize to solve the biggest problems of the day, including how to defeat Hitler, how to defeat Japan, uh, Italy, and so on. But the second lesson learned, which was a simultaneous lesson learned, was that what I like to call a crusading state could be created, one that was very thick and, on, and rich in a sense of strong public interest for democracy, against dictatorship, against fascism, against, against totalitarianism, but very thin on procedures. So we created a two-sided American state during and after the Second World War, one that was um, parliamentary, procedural, democratic, where outcomes to policy were always provisional and remain so, and another side in which um, very thin procedures obtain, in which the Atomic Energy Act of 1946 said that whole realm belongs only to the President of the United States. 1949, Congress votes to exempt the Central Intelligence Agency from budgetary oversight of the Congress. That is, we've created in our areas of national security a huge zone of what might be called democratic or parliamentary exceptions. And the great question, it seems to me, posed by this two-sided state um, is not whether one is good and one is bad. Um, uh, one can argue easily that they were both, um, in their own ways, triumphs. Um, we need some kind of national security state to deal with emergencies and enemies. Um, but how does it connect to the procedural, democratic, parliamentary, more messy state? And that's a puzzle we have yet to fully figure out. So to my taste, the victory over fascism, the victory over Nazism, the victory over, victory over Japanese militarism opened an era in which simultaneously we have a triumph, a victory of parliamentary democracy and the great challenge of how to manage democratic and parliamentary exceptions um, in an era where questions of national, external, and internal security have not and will not disappear. I thank the CUNY Graduate Center and John Torpy for the honor of the invitation. And I agree with the panelists that this is a momentous occasion. It's impossible to capture this war in words. 55 million deaths, World War II, 
There's never been a war like that before, and let's hope never again a war like that. The number may not be exact, but when you get into the, those, that scale of death, it's very hard to count accurately. Of the 55 million deaths, approximately half, 27 million, are likely Soviet Union deaths. Uh, no defeated power has ever suffered in a war the way the Soviets did, and of course they were on the victorious side. Probably at least a third of their GDP was destroyed. More than a thousand cities were wiped from the face of the earth that is made into rubble. 70,000 villages also wiped from the face of the earth. 25 million of the survivors were homeless, and many of those who were not homeless were living in stationary railroad cars or huts made of mud that they dug out of the ground. So this is a really big war. China is also a big part of the story, not part of our discussion today. Probably 10 to 13 million of the deaths of the 55 million are China, and of course they're also on the victorious side. And so we need to try to remember the scale of what happened. The United States, for the most part, defeated Japan in East Asia. Spectacular victory, unbelievable military logistics and production to defeat the Japanese army in the Pacific. In the uh, European theater, the Soviet Union predominantly defeated the German land army. Uh, it was very difficult to defeat something like the German land army, especially with their allies. The Soviets were the only power capable of doing that. That didn't mean they would, but they did. The United States contribution was significant in Europe, uh, but nothing like the Soviet contribution to the defeat of Germany. Uh, Britain's contribution is also significant, primarily because they refused to capitulate to the Germans after France fell. Sometimes people underestimate this act, but it was a very significant act not to capitulate and cut a deal uh, with Nazi Germany. So this is a big war, and this is a big commemoration. Now, about the defeat of fascism. So I don't subscribe to the view that this is the defeat of fascism. Uh, there's a political nature to that construct. The defeat of fascism is a part of the legitimation of the Soviet Union. The Soviets feel that if they can explain the war in terms of the defeat of fascism, that they have earned the victory and moreover that their system is legitimized by this defeat. The costs of the victory to the Soviets were not just the destruction and the deaths during the war, but the fact that the Stalinist system was legitimized and remained in place. <coughs> the Stalinist system was evil. It killed many millions of its own people, and it would have killed many millions more people had it not been stopped in the Cold War confrontation. And so when we talk about the cost of the war, we have to talk about the fact that one of the powers that won, the Soviet power, was also an evil regime. The the victory was a bitter victory, not only because of the destruction, the physical destruction, but also because of the persistence, the endurance of this regime. Now, this regime calling its uh, victory the defeat of fascism, as I said, is a political project. Many of the Germans who were captured by the Soviets, when they were called fascists by the Soviets, got angry. They took it as an insult. They said, we're not fascists, we're Nazis. The fascists were the Italians. This is a non-trivial point. In the same way that some of you might object, for example, to the idea of totalitarianism, the idea of equating uh, the Soviet Union, Stalin Soviet Union, and the Nazi regime, or the Nazi and the Italian fascist regime with the Soviet Union, I object to the conflation of these powers as a kind of fascist front that was defeated. This is part of the interwar popular front movement, the attempt to get a coalition on the left against the radical right. The popular front was a failure, and it was a failure because the communists uh, were never interested in a legitimate popular front. They betrayed the social democrats every chance that they could get. 
They knifed in the back all the social democrats, and sometimes not in the back, but in the front. And so the failure of the popular front, we saw this in Spain, but not only in Spain, uh, is, is an important aspect of our history that we need to remember when we try to, when sometimes we follow the Soviet and now the Russian line that the Soviet victory is a defeat of fascism. I could make further details about this statement, but Stalin never saw the popular front, the leftist popular front alignment against fascism as a serious proposition. There was a brief moment between 1935 and 1937 when the Comintern effectively had uh, signed on to the Popular Front policy, which was uh, beloved by many of the foreign communists who made up the Comintern. Uh, but it was not a policy close to Stalin's heart ever. He called the Social Democrats social fascists, and he felt the rivals on the left the social democratic rivals on the left were a greater threat than the radical right. And Stalin is partly responsible for Hitler's aggrandizement in Europe. And this we must remember. In fact, Franco created a successful popular front on the right, which is one of the reasons he was victorious in Spain, like it or not. And so this type of history where the Soviets uh, use the catch-all phrase fascism, the victory over fascism, is a political project that we see in Russia today. In many ways, the Russians are using World War II as the central feature of their national history now. It, it's deserved. They won. It was an unbelievable victory. They defeated the Nazi land army. The sacrifices are unfathomable. At the same time, however, we have to be careful because what they're doing today in Russia is to decommunize the Soviet regime. It turns out Stalin wasn't really a communist. <laughs> it turns out that he was instead just a patriot, and he defeated this evil fascism. And Stalin's murders, and Stalin's own deportations of peoples, and Stalin's many other crimes are now just things that either are played down or were necessary to defeat fascism and we're not about a communist program of social engineering and building a new world the way the fascist or the Nazi programs were in addition, as Professor Meyer pointed out. You know, so I'm a little bit hesitant to adopt this framework for all of the reasons that I've laid out. At the same time, I don't want to diminish the Soviet victory in the war. By no means do I want to diminish that, nor do I want to diminish the complicated questions of the fact that many of the Soviet inhabitants chose their own regime over the Nazi regime when given a choice by Hitler's occupying army. But that choice was a tragic one. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, both Professors Kotkin and Katz Nelson have sort of gotten into the post-war arrangements from, their perspect from the perspective of their regions of the world. Um, but I wonder if you might say a little bit about the post-war arrangements in Europe, the Marshall Plan, the significance of uh, you know, the United States' participation in rebuilding Western Europe, the emergence of the Cold War, and you all could certainly jump in where you think that's appropriate. But I thought um, you hadn't said too much about the post-war <coughs> arrangements. No, because fascism in Western Europe really ceased to exist as a political force. We had occupying forces in Germany. I think this is an important point. I mean, the, the claim of fascism was you guys know how to make war. Mm. This, is, uh, the, this is the way we think. We think of politics as war. It's, uh, and we think of war, and not just Clausewitz, we think of war as politics. We think of politics as war. And uh, it, it, Stalinism at various points uh, did a similar operation and invented enemies. But the, po the, the point, I think, is that the defeat of fascism showed that these regimes, Germany and Italy particularly, uh, to a certain extent, some of the satellites, uh, Hungary, Romania, did not, could not deliver on what they said they were mm -hmm. best at. They said, our claim is we, we, are, we, we conduct wars well. And ultimately, as, as, as uh, Ira 
uh, said, you know, a messy democracy and, uh, and quite a, uh, you know, a coherent dictatorship managed to, to beat that coalition. It wasn't easy and it was a tremendous cost. But I think this is why in many ways, except for cer certain nostalgias and others, and uh, the, the fascist alternative was not an alternative, serious alternative in Europe. Of course, there are SS reunions, all these things we know about, but it's a mass alternative. Now, what uh, the United States, so the United States thrust in Europe when it came about after it, we, we policed Germany along with Britain, to a lesser degree France and Western Germany. Uh, it was, uh, despite all the complaints that Nur Nuremberg was incomplete, that the West German, the judicial processes were incomplete, in, in fact, it was clear that this was a political movement whose excesses were to be punished, it was punished, uh, and we helped set up a West German, a viable West German state, bringing in the, uh, you know, the people who came out of concentration camps or abro from abroad and reestablishing uh, the Germany that uh, was, was, was evoked uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, and I think this, I think the United States is, uh, can be can be proud of that. I re I remember reading this. Who was the radio columnist about twenty years ago? Farber. He was a really conservative man. He he really uh, very conservative radio columnist in New York. But he wrote a column which moved me very much. He talked somewhere in the sixties or seventies. They wanted finally painted over a billboard on a New York building on, uh, over near West End Avenue, a Riverside Drive, saying "Buy war bonds." And, he, and it was finally painted over, and he said, you know, that made me feel sad. And although I didn't share his politics, I understood, you know, that this had been uh, a, a, a significant moment. And I think we carried that, we carried that forward. Uh, I think the Marshall Plan, uh, the Marshall Plan obviously was a significant uh, uh, initiative, not because of a huge amount of money that we, that we gave, although we gave a significant amount, not because the Europeans, uh, the Europeans did not put in their own capital, but because it showed, demonstrated a certain solidarity. Uh, this is, I think, I mean, I guess if we want to talk about ideologies, uh, I think the ideology that's at short, not ideology, but the impulse that sometimes at least uh, in shortest supply today is that of solidarity, uh, especially uh, in the United States over the last 25 years, uh, and the United States possessed it at a certain point. It was one of the New Deal legacies. Uh, uh, it, it had animated the social democratic position. Fascism just was a higher a notion of hierarchy. There was the solidarities were only uh, uh, among ethnic groups, among nations. It, it offered a vision of solidarity, but it was one that necessarily implied a, a conflictuality with anyone outside the group, whether it was the German folk, whether it was the Italian uh, national group, what, uh, whatever, that this, uh, this was a solidarity that had to be uh, uh, military and directed against other people. And uh, happily, I think the United States did have a vision of solidarities which were far more in, 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 in cl inclusive. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I think, uh, you know, we, we have played an important role. And it's, uh, the, it's, it's up to the Europeans in a certain sense, I think, if we're looking ahead. The European Union was a response to this, although it wasn't necessary to keep Europe at peace. Germany was divided. It was sat upon. Uh, <coughs> but the notion that there could be a community in Western Europe or in Europe that could extend itself has been very important. It's come upon hard times in recent years, I think, but it still is a very valid uh, response, and I think it will uh, eventually pick up its, its speed again. There are two or three um, fascinating, to me, fascinating um, ironies of the, of, of the moment. I would say that Western Europe, after the war, into the 1950s, um, was remade um, in part on the model of what I would call the left wing of the American New Deal. Um, democratic, but with a, a capitalism that had planning um, elements built in, a reasonably ass assertive a democratic state. 
um, setting limits on and directing forms of different kinds of forms, some corporatist, some not, of market capitalism. Um, uh, it, it, the kind of um, experiments that were conducted under the um, historians think ill-fated, um, but still, um, I think, more complicated, a National Industrial Recovery Act of the early New Deal, were models that actually were brought by the same New Dealers um, into to Germany, uh, to Western Europe, to the Marshall Plan, and so on, so that post-war social democracy in Europe, for example, looked more like the left wing of the New Deal than it looked like social democracy in the high Marxist moment, even revisionist Marxist moment of the, uh, of the early 20th century. Um, so in that sense, the United States played a very direct role of not only in creating global institutions um, within which Europe was inserted, um, but creating, affecting, becoming a constitutive part of the new democratic world of Western Europe. The same moment, the, in the late World War II period and early post-war period, the United States, we might recall, still had a racially segregated army. Um, it had 17 states that legally practiced Jim Crow. It had a one-party authoritarian system embedded within American democracy. And one of the great effects of the war was to increasingly make that untenable, both because, for ideological reasons, a war against Nazism, um, which was in part a war against a form of racism, could not easily go hand in hand with um, uh, legal racism in America. Um, and the Cold War, as it began, put enormous pressures on the United States. Um, uh, to transcend this uh, deep inegalitarianism, especially because American communists, their one great ethical claim, and it was a legitimate one, was they were taking more risks, they were in, to use a communist word, the vanguard of, um, of um, uh, often very courageous uh, civil rights movement. And it became very hard to confront what... Uh, uh, Professor Kotkin rightly calls the evil um, features of Stalinism um, while being holding fast to um, a Jim Crow system in the United States. So the, the victory over fascism translates doubly into a, um, uh, uh, the best parts of the American New Deal era um, moving into Europe as, as well as Japan. Um, while the worst parts of the American, um, what, what Myrtle was calling the American dilemma in mm. that period, um, were held up um, uh, uh, for um, uh, brightly, bright light shine on, on those features that made it impossible for them to simply re be reproduced um, well into the future. And that, that's a feature of the victory, oh, what we're calling in this session, victory over fascism, even though we have some questions about that language. Um, uh, certainly, that, a feature of that victory, which translated back into democratic transformations um, within the United States. And that, in the long run, has made the victory even more important. Did you want to add anything to that? or? You know, so the, how, how, did the, how did the Soviet Union come out on the victorious side? Let's be honest. Uh, people didn't think the Soviets could possibly beat the Germans. Six days into the war, that is to say June 28th, 1941, um, Stalin called the Defense Commissariat, which is just a stone's throw away, requesting a report over the phone of the battlefront. And they said, we don't know. We don't, we, we've lost contact with the front. Stalin got in the car, others along with him who were in the Kremlin at the time, drove over to the defense commissariat on the embankment, five minute drive, went up to the defense commissariat, the defense commissar office, about this size, Bunch of maps all over the wall, people running in and out. Stalin ordered a report. And the guy was honest. 
His name was Timoshenko, Marshal Timoshenko, Simeon Timoshenko. And he said, the, um, the Germans are on the eastern side of Minsk. And that meant Minsk had fallen. Minsk was on the road to Moscow. Now, Minsk, Smolensk, Moscow. That was Napoleon's route. And the Soviet army, the Red Army, as it was called at the time, was deployed in Ukraine to stop the German advance into Ukraine because that was the disinformation that the Germans had spread of where they would have their main thrust. And instead, they had their main thrust in the center, not in the south. And Stalin uh, shouted an obscenity and left, drove to his dacha, and disappeared for two days. This is the origin of the Khrushchev story about how Stalin had a nervous breakdown. He didn't have a nervous breakdown. He was in his office for the first six days, uh, 16, 18, 20-hour days. But then on the 28th, when Minsk fell, it looked like the war was over. And he retreated. And they had to go out to the dacha a couple days later and retrieve him, and bring him back to his office in the Kremlin. And I think most of your pundits thought the Soviet Union would collapse like a house of cards. Certainly Hitler and the German military brass thought that the Soviet army wasn't up to this fight. <coughs> and yet, you know, they took Berlin. So this is a difficult problem to explain. If you use the Hitler uh, mistakes explanation, which is very popular, Hitler made many mistakes and he wasn't a great military commander and we could go into them if you want, but the Hitler mistakes explanation doesn't give any credit to the Soviet system. You see, Hitler lost. The Soviets didn't really win. And if Hitler hadn't made the mistakes, he would have won. This is a popular view. Um, however, it's just not true. Hitler made many mistakes, but actually the Nazi land army had to be defeated. They fought to the last drop of blood, even when the war was definitely lost. They were still fighting. Pretty spectacular. How difficult it was, two years after Stalingrad in 1943 to get to Berlin, and a tremendous number of casualties taken on that long march from Stalingrad to Berlin. So the Soviets, actually, they won the war. Well, how did they win? They won because their factories outproduced the German factories. It's a very significant point. That's how the United States won the war in East Asia as well. It was a production war, and the Soviets managed, despite losing about one-third of their industrial territory in the western part of the country, managed to outproduce the Germans. In fact, the Soviet tanks were higher quality tanks, not just higher in quantity, but higher in quality. So it's a factory production war, and the Soviets prove uh, capable. They prove up to the job. Now, part of it is the American land lease. The Americans are supplying many of the products that the Soviets are not very good at, and that enables the Soviets to concentrate on what they are good at. Radios, canned spam or, or food for the soldiers at the front, trucks to a certain extent. These are significant, but exaggerated in their significance. It's not the radios primarily or the trucks, the vehicles, it's the Soviet tanks and the steel, the metal, uh, that is crucial. Soviet aviation, the planes. And so that's the first part of the explanation. And the second part of the explanation is the generalship got better over time. The Soviet generals didn't really understand warfare yet, modern warfare, and they learned. It was a painful process of learning. And there was a lot of suffering because they had to learn. You know, I learn a little bit of history. If I make some mistakes, the students just walk out of the room misinformed. <laughs> the Soviet generals make mistakes on the battlefield, and a million men are encircled. So they learned, and the learning process was painful and difficult. Stalin also learned during the war. <clears throat> a lot of the generals wrote memoirs after Stalin died. And you won't believe it, but in the general's memoirs, it turned out Stalin was the fool and the generals were geniuses. And it was Stalin who did the learning. This, of course, as I said, all was written, imagined, after Stalin was in the grave. But he did learn during the war, and he became a more capable leader 
a more capable wartime leader, and this was significant. And so for all his crimes, uh, which are, are too great to enumerate here, he also deserves some of the credit for the war victory. The Soviet system also was good at organization, but in a Soviet way, which was very coercive. They had um, a tremendous amount of coercion imposed even greater during the wartime in some ways than in the, in the peacetime, and coercion in the peacetime was uh, very significant too. But they still were able to organize. They were still able to mobilize. American society proved to be the greatest mobilization society we've ever, we've ever seen. What the Americans were able to do, not only in the war, but after the war, the space program, for example, right? As Professor Mayer and Katz Nelson have been discussing, American mobilization was surprising because everybody dismissed liberal democracy, constitutional order as capable of mobilization, but it turns out they're better at mobilization and at production than the authoritarian systems. The Soviets managed the mobilization also. And we have to also say that one of the reasons the Soviets won was because the value of life was very low. They were willing to make sacrifices that uh, democracy is just unwilling to make. They were willing to take losses that were so significant, but in many ways necessary, although not always necessary, for the battles that they engaged in. Stalingrad, Kursk, and then all the battles back, as I said, up to Berlin. Willingness to take the East European capitals, for example, which the Americans were unwilling to take because of the casualties that were potentially involved. That story is a complex story, but there's some truth to that. And so in the end, the, the fact that they lost 27 million, including 7 million soldiers, was part of the reason that they won, because they were willing to make those kind of sacrifices. So you put it all together and you get a story of Soviet victory, not predominantly Hitler's mistakes. Hitler made those mistakes, and they were significant, uh, but they were not significant enough uh, for the Soviet victory. And so the Soviets won. And they felt that they won, and Stalin felt that he won, but the system had changed in many ways. And people were looking for a different Soviet Union after World War II. They were looking for maybe a little bit more freedom, a little bit uh, to span the enslavement of the peasantry, known as collective farms, allow the kind of travel that the soldiers had undertaken in wartime, but allow that for a peacetime population. There were many different proposals sent in by people of how to reform the system in the uh, mid to late 40s. And these were all put in the drawer. Stalin dismissed all the possibilities for change. And he rebuilt the system that had been built prior to the war and that he felt the war victory had legitimized, even though it was touch and go for a while. And so the whole world shifts. No more Nazism in Germany. No more fascism in Italy. No more dictatorship in Japan. Instead, you've got parliamentary regimes, constitutional orders, rule of law, democracy, pluralism, open public sphere. It's spectacular, the changes post-World War II. Decolonization, a topic we haven't really touched, the end of the British Empire, the end of the other empires, reluctantly and in many ways nasty process but nonetheless, decolonization. And I could go on. Certainly, discussions between left and right about how best to organize society and what were the bases of solidarity, but acceptance of a market economy, absolutely, compared to the Soviet Union. Amelioration of capitalism, discussions of how to be fairer, how to make capitalism work better for more people, certainly but nonetheless, acceptance of the market. So you got markets or private property, you got rule of law, you got decolonization, you got a whole new world because it's the predominant trend. It's no longer a trend fighting against the authoritarianism of the interwar period. And these are colossal changes. And above all, you have the United States engaged permanently in managing an international order and delivering global public goods. This is also very important. That doesn't mean everything the United States did was the right thing. That doesn't mean uh, I would myself validate or applaud everything the United States did in creating the international order. 
but certainly very different from what you get after World War I. But one country didn't shift, the Soviets. They reproduced their authoritarian system, monopoly communist party, state-owned and state-managed economy, censorship, monopoly over the public sphere, and a form, if you will, of colonialization or colonies inside with satellites as well as the so-called Union Republics. The Soviets are not moving in the new direction that most of the rest of the world is in. They're in the same direction. And so now we have a Cold War confrontation that was unforeseen by most of the people who were alive at the time, most of the planners of the war, most of the executors of the war, most of the diplomatic corps that were thinking about the post-World War II order, did not necessarily foresee the dimensions of this confrontation. It was a surprise to many and it was a disappointment to many that this task suddenly confronted the world that the wartime coalition was no longer in action, that instead the coalition had divided, and that a large part of the world went one way, and another part of the world went another way. It was hard to see at the time, because communism hit China in 1949 with the victory in the Civil War by Mao and his uh, comrades. There was the Korean War, as you know, and there were other aspects that made it look like communism was on the march. But in fact, communism was now in a different game. You see, they had the answer to the German tanks, but they didn't have the answer to American, European, and Japanese freedom, nor did they have the answer to American, European, and Japanese consumer society. You know, my father worked in an embroidery factory, and he bought a house. And that was what the Soviets were up against. My father was a working class guy and he bought a house. And the Soviets had no answer for that. They had no answer for nylon stockings, for chemical perms, for children's toys, for the whole slew of things that became the basis of post-World War II societies. The welfare state, obviously a big part of this, and obviously the Soviets factor into that. And so this is very important to understand that they won the war and they lost the peace. Now, the losing of the peace took a long time to unfold. As I say, it was, it was imperceptible to many people at the time. It looked the other way around. It looked like the United States was too weak. It looked like many people complaining the United States wasn't properly standing up to communism. It looked like communism was on the march. It looked like Western Europe could go communist. It looked like a lot of things that were misperceptions at the time. It was the other side that was out of step. Step in, if I could. Um, I mean, I think we've now gotten you know a pretty good sense of what the post-war order looked like. I mean, obviously the Cold War was the defining element until 1989 or 1990. Um, but in thinking about this background and this past, um, I mean, there have been a couple of recent developments that it seems to me sharply call into question the sort of persistence of this order. One is this recent uh, creation, basically by the Chinese, of this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which the Obama administration called a number of European, West European allies, mm. explicitly pleaded with them you know, not to sign on, and they said, we simply can't say no. We have to join this thing. And then in the last few days, um, the Chinese and the Russians have announced that right after Russia's Victory Day, where China will be the, you know, the number one guest in attendance, the Chinese and the Russians are going to uh, conduct joint military exercises in the Mediterranean <coughs> Sea. Now, somebody commenting on this age, Asian uh, Infrastructure mm. Investment Bank said, you know, this was a major power struggle, and we're not in the era of 1945 anymore. And the United States lost. And I'd really be interested to hear uh, me, what you think about that. This isn't Kansas anymore. Uh, the, you know, I, if you, it, it raises the question of what, what historians love to call periodization. Mm. It's, our, it's our professional tick. Uh, it seems to me that what we have, that the world that fascism challenged and that in which we defeated fascism was a world that somehow has ended somewhere in the, between 1970s and 1990, 
2001, if you wish. But th this is uh, you know, one, one thing worth thinking about is that the myth of anti-fascism cemented much of the European left, as well as the R Russians in their way of national liberation, uh, up uh, th uh, through 68, uh, and it's not, it's not the, the, it's not the binding myth anymore. Mm. When we sell it, when we go, I go to conferences on World War II uh, for the last 20 years, the Holocaust and the defeat of the, you know, ending the Holocaust has been in a sense the overriding image, although obviously for uh, good reasons or not, this was not the major thrust of, of what we were fighting for in Europe or what other people cared about. But we have taken, fascism is in a sense gone as a legitimating myth in the, in the West, Western left. Mm. And uh, otherwise I think the European Union would react more strongly to things such as the tendencies in Hungary for you know, about authoritarianism. Uh, the question of uh, the Holocaust is crucial uh, to constituting memory in, in, in fact, in the countries that carried it out. Uh, I do a lot of work there on these on memorialization. And so it does seem to me that somehow we have entered a new era in which this victory has been assimilated and, you know, we are back to a different sort of uh, struggle. And the question is, you know, is the United States or its institutions that we celebrate for this period really as robust as we would like to think, really as much of a paragon or model as, as we would like to think? And we are, you know, we ourselves have great doubts after Vietnam, after uh, this one lesson, I think, that uh, one learned from fascism and from the Soviet Union, when it was the Soviet Union, is that these ideologies of extremism work and have legs, so to speak, when they are affiliated with states. Uh, the communist appeal throughout the interwar period was often, we have to defend the Soviet Union. It's the only place where communism has taken power. Fascism worked when there were States that incorporated it. We have, you know, the this is it's no accident that ISIS wants to be a state uh, as well as a caliphate. So I think we are in a very different world, and the world I think we're in, uh, the Soviet, the Russian Chinese, I don't know what you want to call it, rapprochement or common exercise. I mean, this seems to me, in some senses, more familiar. It's more like the 19th century pre World War One with great power politics. Uh, I do think we are not, the United States at this point uh, is not, doesn't have a clear view. I mean, I think the Eastern Pacific, uh, Western Pacific, I guess, is really, a, you know, a very delicate strategic point, is delicate clearly uh, for potential war and escalation of crises. Uh, I'm not sure we, we have a coherent strategy and the Chinese clearly, this is this is not an, this is this is not sense. I think an ideolo It's not an ideological power in the way it was under Mao. Clearly, it's a it's a type of uh, you know party sponsored uh, economic uh, transformatory power, and uh, the Russians can sense that it's a, a vigorous potential uh, ally. So I think the I think in a certain sense we you know history is wonderful. It's a living, uh, and uh, we practice it. And I, but I think we have to realize at what points historically things move on beyond where they where they were. This is this. Let me conclude. You know, Tony Judd wrote a great book called Post War. On uh, in 2005, he published his you know, final major work. It is an extraordinary book in synthesizing. Eastern and Western Europe. And yet, when my view of it was, in a sense, it was dominated by memory. The last chapter of it is the house of mem uh, memory. Uh, it was as if all of everything, the Europe had been an epilogue to this great war. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's been the case for, uh, you know, uh, 30 years or so. That, you know, one, is, one has new constellations. So, uh, uh, yeah, and I think we have to come, come to terms with that. So I'm not sure where we are.
the world. But I, but I don't think we are, you know, insofar as we see the fascist impulse, the ethnicity, the, uh, the, I, the belief in, uh, in inequality, fundamental human inequalities, it's in, uh, it's in the fringe parties. On the, they're not so fringy, but the, you know, the, the reaction against immigration and the like, uh, those impulses are eternal. They're not instantiated in fascist parties as such. Uh, uh, with few exceptions, and, but we have, this is a world that's very hard to realize, and all this great stuff about the United States, look, I, I share it, I loved it, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see that we're the, really there at this point. I mean, Congress's parliamentarism is become, uh, you know, a, a gridlock situation, uh, and ex we don't know what, to, how to balance our allies and our friends, it's hard to know what they are, so yeah, we're in for rough water, right? I mean, it may be that, that that world is in a certain sense gone, but it also strikes me that the history still, I mean, Professor Kotkin already spoke to this, the significance of this history in legitimating certain things that its current ruler wants to do, for example. Um, and, you know, I think in the case of Germany, which you know so well, um, you know, this is a history that they can't forget and in a certain sense don't want to forget. Um, so, you know, there, it does play a role in well, not saying... people's thinking about the past and, and, and about the present. So I'm curious what you would say about, you know, I mean, it, the war took place somewhere else for Americans. So our historical relationship to it is quite different, I think. It's, of course, these are rich and complicated questions. I may intersect this line of thought in two ways. Uh, first, to observe that... Um, in the United States, but not only in the United States, there's been a surprising, surprising from the perspective, say, of 1989 or 1991 with the end of communism, um, uh, a surprising degree of what might be called anxiety about liberal democracy and its capacities. Um, you really can't find a, um, uh, a democracy today, whether it be in Argentina or Mexico or India or Japan or South Africa or the United States. And by this I mean reasonably either very established or reasonably well established democracies where no one expects a coup tomorrow or an authoritarian government uh, to triumph. You find an enormous amount of um, worry, some of which echoes the language of concern of the 1920s about the capacity of liberal democracies to govern effectively by identifying and solving big problems. So Charlie, what you say about gridlock or in America is just one symptom of, of that. So from whence do these um, anxieties come? What, um, it seems to me there are really a, a number of different hypotheses one could have. Um, uh, one of which simply has to, might have to do with changes to the character of problems themselves, um, issues like um, uh, climate, um, which have long time horizons and cross national borders, and parliamentary democracies are good at short time horizons mm. and sticking within national borders. Or one might say that um, the anxieties of democracy come from um, uh, the imminent um, uh, problems of uh, democratic rule, the polarization, the money in politics, the provisional senses of competing public interest ideas as opposed to a unitary sense of public interest, that these above a certain threshold become pathologies and um, uh, paralyzing uh, uh, features. Or one might say that the current situation is um, marked by the liberal democracies facing new forms of authoritarianism of which both the Chinese and Russian models are not trivial. They combine capitalism with um, authoritarianism. Um, and, uh, you know, Mr. Urban in Hungary will make a speech in July of 2014 saying proudly, we are an illiberal democracy, um, uh, and uh, we believe in authoritarian um, features of, um, uh, proudly, not 
mm -hmm. saying we're fascist, no, but uh, saying we're not liberal representative Democrats in the sense that the West would like us um, to be. Now, this is unexpected, um, let alone the issues of the resurgence of religious zealotry in the world. So we face, um, from within the democracies and from without, a series of challenges um, which the repertoire of language, memory, and institutions dating to this wartime, Second World War triumph, don't give us sure guidance um, about. And finally, I would say on this question, I'm, so I've been trying to ruminate myself these last few days about what I might, what might be called um, the, um, the resurgence of Peronism globally, a sense of, um, when Peron was elected president, I'm no Latin Americanist, I may have this all wrong, but he was elected president of, um, got elected multiple times in a democratic franchise. He had a party that ran for office. But it was not a, a, a liberal regime, but it was a populist regime. It made the argument that the people should be mobilized more directly in politics on behalf of some kind of collective venture to rectify a variety of inequalities. And there's a Chinese version of that today. There's a Russian version of that story today. There was a Louisiana version of it in 1934. There were Louisiana version of it. That's quite right. And there are Western European versions of it. You could see in some political parties in, Scotland, in, in, um, in Sweden or in uh, UKIP in Britain. Um, or the Le Pen's family um, outfit in France. Um, these are not capital F fascist in the strong sense of the word, but they are, they have a high family resemblance um, to the strategies of mobilization and institutions that characterize uh, Peronist populism. And I think that, I wouldn't call it quite fascism, you could, but I would, um, I see it as a, as a new form of illiberal democracy. And um, uh, I think the current contests are about um, the capacities of liberal democracies um, to effectively govern and confront illiberal democratic strains, both from within and from without. And um, I don't know how to predict where we'll be in 5, 10, or 20 years whether the European experiment, um, which is, was a great moral victory, not just a practical one, of the European Union, of even the collected uh, the currency, um, all that, whether that can hold. Um, and if it doesn't, I think we'll see a, a much greater efflorescence of um, illiberal Peron-style um, movements, both of the right and the left, but without a parliamentary center holding. And in the United States, which of course is not about to have a collapse of our democracy, but we also see um, deep enough disaffections with parties, uh, elections, Congress, um, and attempts to create um, ways around it through various forms of American populism of the right and the left, a Tea Party as well as Occupy Wall Street. Um, we see a movement that tries to validate forms of deliberative democracy as distinct from parliamentary competitive democracy. And we see a kind of um, impulse toward direct um, uh, 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 voting on policy, where, such as the California model, which bypasses legislative messy democratic politics by putting every question up to popular referendum. Um, uh, we may be entering a new age of referenda, as in the, whether to stay in the EU in Great Britain. We're about that. We'll, we, I think, likely to have a, maybe not certain, we'll find out in two days, uh, um, a government that will put uh, European participation up for referendum with very uncertain outcomes. Um, and finally, we see, as the Scottish example shows us, um, or the Catalan or others, um, there's no certainty that the boundaries will, um, will hold either in our nation states. So we're, we're entering a period of pretty profound uncertainty.
and no one has yet mentioned um, atomic weapons. Um, one of the questions you told us you might pose had to do with um, periodization of the 20th century. And to me, um, the great divide in the 20th century, or a great divide, not necessarily great, the great divide, came with um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki leading into the 1949 Soviet bomb, um, which means that humankind, as Eisenhower put it in his inaugural in 1952, can never not face the problem of collective annihilation. Um, and how we control that possibility in the next quarter century is complete unknown. It's not just an Iran issue or a North Korea issue. Um, it's, it's quite impossible to imagine a world 25 or 40 years from now in which there hasn't been serious proliferation and in which non-state actors might have access as well as state actors. So we're, we're in a new world. And the capacities of liberal democracy to hold in the face of all these trends is at least a greater challenge, um, potentially, as the democracies um, faced earlier in the 20th century with more um, fixed and positioned anti-democratic alternatives. We have more fluid ones. We're in a much better shape now than, than say, we were when Hitler came to power. But I, I don't know how, to, how optimistic or pessimistic to be when we look ahead. I'm guessing that Professor Kotkin may have a word to say to this. But uh, I wanted to invite you, if anyone has a question, uh, we have a couple of mics that I'd like you to step up to, if you wouldn't mind. We don't have tons of time for questions, I'm afraid. but. Um, please. Hi, I'd like to ask about post-war accountability. In Italy, which switched sides, in France, which switched sides twice, um, and then the Axis satellite allies, Croatia, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, um, was the process of uh, eradication of those who had been part of the fascist or quasi-fascist or collaborationist regimes undertaken strictly by national authorities, how far-reaching did that actually go on? You didn't have international Nuremberg trials for the Italian fascist leaders. Uh, so if you would give an assessment of accountability post-war in, in those countries when it was led by their own folks who had their own scores to settle. And then accountability in the Soviet Union. Let us not forget that Stalin had been, A, in, in Professor Kotkin's wonderful book, uh, fascinated in some degree by Mussolini, uh, and had actually been Hitler's ally for a year and a half. Was there anybody within the Soviet regime who took the fall for having promoted the alliance with Hitler, de facto alliance with Hitler, and then the disaster that ensued, did somebody's head roll, or was that somehow mysteriously airbrushed from the photographs, like so many Kremlin uh, pictures at parades? I won't speak to the Soviets. I'll leave uh, Professor Kotkin to address that. Look, the accountability after World War II and accountability in general uh, is, uh, is, is very imperfect. It's very hard to come into a country and say, we are going to purge the guilty. I mean, do you, if you purge the, uh, the if you purge on the top, what do you do with the, you know, the, 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 with the people who are called the, uh, you know, the bureaucratic perpetrators, what do you do with people who pull the triggers? If you pull, purge the smaller people who pull triggers, what do you do with the people on top? And this process was bound to be very imperfect. When the Cold War came, uh, it was overlaid with very politically motivated trials for the left and the right. I, uh, we can go back over it and write it as a story of continuing and, uh, and injustice, but I, it's, a, it's a half full glass. I think it's important to say that we did, coming out of this, we did start the modern concept that one, aggressive war is 
is punishable. I think this is a great achievement in Nuremberg and, and up to it, uh, even if it was just as a concept. And obviously, it, it, had to, it, it had to be totally inconsistent because Stalin had connived in, in the opening of, of, of the war. Uh, we did make human rights uh, a, 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 a defense of human rights, a concept that would be uh, brought before international tribunals, which it is today in, you know, in The Hague. And uh, people of scholars have complained that the Nuremberg trials did not thematize the Holocaust enough. In fact, when you read the trials, there is amp, the, the Jewish sufferings and, and persecutions are uh, immensely documented in these things. Uh, uh, I think what was left was a sort of a standard to which we can repair, even though it was, it was you know, we have all these cases that make us mad uh, and uh, which testify. So one, uh, my sense is what one, one has redeemed something from from, 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 that, from that experience, which it continues. I mean, here is an institution in The Hague and others which do reflect very directly uh, the effort to deal with fascism. Uh, I, want, I want to, can I just take a minute to speak to uh, something Ira said? Uh, I think, I agree with him, and this is part of what I was trying to say. I do think, one, we do see a type of it's hard to describe these regimes, illiberal democracy. I mean, we look at Turkey, we look at Hungary, uh, all over. This is the temptation, uh, and they are depressingly popular, as are the movements such as Herd Wilders in, in, in the Netherlands or uh, Marine Le Pen. The, the family firm is pretty much split on this uh, at this point. Uh, but there's also what I consider as also disturbing is, in a certain sense, that what you touched on, the defection of intellectuals about democracy. I mean, so many, this whole notion of, I read foreign affairs and elsewhere, Americans and others who say, look, democracy these days, it's just people like us who just talk things out, sit around a table, there's a, a sort of a government by commissions, NGOs, experts. Uh, it's all very well. These are very benevolent and often wise people, and uh, they, they, they get frustrated with messy congresses and parliaments. But it is, in its own way, I think, a very type of subversive notion of arguing with a wide-scale public. So we don't know what to do with the masses. In that sense, this is like the 1920s, and uh, we have to think that through. Uh, anyway, that's good enough. Heads rolled in the Soviet Union, but not those who were responsible. <laughs> no one was held accountable for anything essential. Having said that, I don't uh, subscribe to the 100% condemnation of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. I think it's a complex story in which um, there's a lot of nastiness all around. And I hope to show in the volume two, the forthcoming volume two of my Stalin book, uh, that there was a rationale for the pact and that there was a lot of perfidious activity on the British side and on other sides and that the options for the Soviet Union were limited in part because of the international system and also in part because Stalin's regime was anathema uh, to the democratic regimes and that I fully understand. One of the things, Chamberlain doesn't have a good reputation Neville Chamberlain. I don't think he's ever going to be rehabilitated. <laughs> I think it's pretty much history. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things he argued, Chamberlain, of course, is the one who does the Munich Pact, appeasing Hitler. It wasn't a pejorative term back then. And uh, mistakenly thought he had cut a deal with Hitler that Hitler would uh, uphold and didn't. But Chamberlain argued that um, if I go into the Soviet uh, coalition, an alliance with the Soviet Union to stop Hitler, and we're victorious, uh, who's going to get the Soviet tanks out of Central Europe when it's over? And yeah, that was a problem. That was a really significant problem. The idea of fighting a war against Nazism, which the British did not want to fight at all as a society or its leadership, the Prime Minister Chamberlain, the problem was that the Soviets were not a great bargain. 
to have in Central Europe instead of the Nazi regime. And so this is not, uh, once again, a validation of Chamberlain. I think we're beyond the possibility of that. But nonetheless, it's, a, it's a, an example of the kind of complexity in retelling this history, which I hope to be able to do. Uh, but accountability, I would have to say no. Yeah, two things. Uh, first, you know, we're right now seeing events in Baltimore which bring back the 60s to some. We're seeing the same kind of tropes about 65, 66, and the kind of discussions on the media. And if we go back to the Second World War, we have the example of A. Philip Randolph threatening that major demonstration in Washington that uh, he's prevented to, and the question of social inequality that comes up as a trope coming out of the war, because you know I'm a baby boomer. My parents uh, fought in the war like others in this room. Uh, my, my father and most of my paternal family were at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. So the war had an imprint on me. Uh, and the question of social inequality and how that has been sort of morphed or not morphed in our consciousness of the Second World War since then would be the question to throw to you. And secondly, we have this confluence in our society as Americans. We have a Civil War commemoration going on. We have a World War I commemoration going on. We have a commemoration in Europe of Waterloo. We have the World War II commemoration. And the question is, how is this memory used politically? Because we all know Vietnam was mentioned, that Munich was thrown down our throats as the example not to happen. And we all know the pernicious consequences of that. So I wonder now, in our present day situation, how is World War II used or not used uh, perniciously good to, to bad to uh, reinforce bad policy choices? Point to me. The Rescue the situation, Ira. I, I actually, one of the striking features um, in American life today is how the moment of the great generation and so on has, seems to have passed. That is, that's not the dominant language, right? Which you made this point. The, um, so I think that if you think about current conundrums in American life um, uh, and the invocations of memory, um, uh, we don't hear a lot about the Second World War. Um, it's been normalized, naturalized, um, as a, a great moment of achievement for America, for the West, for democracy, um, but not, um, not taken up by partisans in, in current conundrums as saying, we own this. The way you describe the Soviet Union as having done that um, uh, after the, the victory of the Patriotic War, a, a World War II. It, 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 it's not a mobilizing force on the American right and the Republican Party uh, or on the left and the Democratic um, Party. Uh, I think what um, perhaps we'd be better off if it were in, in some ways if, 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 if we try to put our current dilemmas, whether about race, about inequality, about um, uh, this odd combination of investment and disinvestment in our space, think of Detroit versus booming areas, if we actually tried to have a frame that um, considered some of the issues we were discussing earlier. But I think what's so striking and I think problematical about contemporary debates is there um, unframed and often anomic quality. Um, uh, they're, not, they're not highly shaped by formed ideologies except against government or for, they're not rich. Our discourse um, uh, is, uh, tends to be reactive to immediate problems. So today we talk, as we should, about Baltimore or Ferguson or what have you. Um, Yesterday, we weren't talking about that. We were talking about something else. There isn't a lot of coherence to our, um, to our politics. And I think that uh, we have polarization without content um, and without uh, sufficient historical memory. Um, so I'm not sure that the, uh, the world of memory is playing out in our daily life. Uh, during the 1930s, uh, who do you think the United States felt was more repulsive, uh, Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin? And did we ever uh, have an opportunity to ally 
ourselves, meaning the United States, with Adolf Hitler to, to, to totally destroy the Soviet Union. Professor Kotkin. That was a question about the United States. <laughs> well, you, you, one thing it can be said is that Harry Truman at one point before he became, when he was still a senator, said, we should let these guys fight it out. I mean, I think there was a, you know, a, a deep distrust of both. Uh, the, the United States, after all, remember, is, is, did not enter this war. It took the Japanese uh, attack on Pearl Harbor to bring us in. There were many currents of isolation. There were strong currents of isolationism. There was abhorrence of Hitler, but a belief we should not get involved. Uh, so I, uh, I think we would have entered the war even without the attack on Pearl Harbor. This was Roosevelt's devious greatness in a certain sense. But it, uh, I, don't, I don't think, uh, in a certain sense, we, even in World War I, we, our establishment and our leadership wanted to be in a position to help shape a post-war order. And to do that, you had to have a, you know, skin in the game. And uh, so I don't think we could be completely, uh, ha could have been completely hands off. Different people had different, many people did think that the, the, the uh, non-aggression pact was justified. The, the, the Western powers, France and Britain seemed, from a Soviet viewpoint, from an American viewpoint, often, uh, you know, totally uh, feckless in, in dealing with, uh, with Russia. I'd like to make one point, though, and that relates to uh, what Ira just said. You know, World War II is a successful war. It set out to defeat Japanese militarism, that is on our side and on our allies' side, and the threat of uh, fascism and, and not Nazi totalitarianism, and it achieved it. I mean, you know, the notion that we, you know, it, it came at a high cost for Eastern Europe and the Cold War, but the but the, what, the objective of World War II, it resolved itself. We did set up a UN. We participated in a UN. World War I, in some sense, has left us many more unsoluble problems. I mean, everything in the Middle East that, we, that every day we read about and uh, uh, sometimes despair about is really the legacy of the First World War and the messy crumbling and non-crumbling of imperial orders. You mentioned decolonization. This is an achievement. It's chalked up to World War II. So in a certain sense, la guerre est finie. You know, I think World War II is, uh, is over. It's right we commemorate this as, as we are. But it's, uh, I don't think it is, uh, and even the communist legacy, the, the power of the Soviet Union over Eastern Europe and, and, and the, the Cold War has, you know, changed what we see in Russia and China is, with Russia and China is not a Cold War phenomenon. The, 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 with respect to the Soviet Union, um, I spent some time when working on this book, Fear Itself, reading um, various national security papers and archives. And there was a moment when the United States had an atomic monopoly when very substantial um, preemptive new, uh, atomic uh, plans were drawn up um, and debated. Um, uh, about what to do and whether to use the weapon before the Soviets would get theirs. Um, uh, uh, and Bertrand Russell advocated. Yeah, well, it, but but I'm talking about inside the America, yeah. the American new national security state. I don't mean to argue that this was a dominant view or about to happen, um, but the issue of what to do about a, a totalitarian enemy. Um, uh, was uh, quite profound. Um, uh, and if you read those documents, they, they discuss how many bombs will we need for how many cities to be destroyed the way Hiroshima and Nagasaki were destroyed, um, what kind of, what you would need to do to utterly eliminate the Soviet industrial structure um, uh, to, and flatten it. Um, and, and, and so on, and the um, and the great fear was, which was a perfectly realistic fear, that uh, very soon there will be a Soviet bomb, um, and once that happens, the United States will never be secure again. Um, that the protection, which since the founding of being protected on the one side by the Pacific, which Pearl Harbor slightly disturbed, but the heartland wasn't hit. Um, and protected by the Atlantic, that that protection would be gone uh, 
Even as early as 1946, I mean, this is, um, you should all look at this if you can by, um, in your libraries or what. And there's this issue, and I think it was November, um, uh, uh, maybe it was even 45, a special issue of Life magazine, which portrayed um, Soviet rockets, which didn't exist then, let alone a Soviet bomb, um, coming across um, to the United States and rendering this country uh, helpless. There's a, a, a drawing of where we are, Fifth Avenue, um, utterly decimated, and the only thing left standing are the two lions in front of the library, um, uh, <laughs> blocked uh, up from this. But there was a period of a kind of um, atomic fear, which anticipatory fear that generated um, uh, extraordinary potential plans vis-a-vis um, -vis that period's um, enemy. And, um, uh, you know, it never happened, but the, uh, the world ushered in is, is still with us. I'm afraid we're running out of time, so I want to just give you one last chance to say a final word if you'd like to. Well, it's hard to sum up all the stuff that's been said, so I obviously won't try to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that Kennan said, one of the great things that Kennan said was not to become like your enemy in defeating your enemy. And so the idea of using nuclear bombs to kill civilians, for example, is a certain measure, a certain means that potentially could be seen as crossing that line, where the goal might be one thing, but the method to get to the goal might transform who you are. And I think that's a really important lesson. You know, the United States won World War II, and it also won the peace. That's really the big story that we've been talking about today. It built institutions, it built international organizations, it stood up to the Soviets, it made tremendous mistakes, carried out tremendous injustices all across during the Cold War. The Vietnam War, there are many things that we could discuss. But nonetheless, it won the peace. And that was a really big victory to win the peace. You know, the last Soviet troops were now Russian troops, and they left East Germany in 1994. The Soviet Union had 650,000 troops in Eastern Europe, 400,000 in East Germany. And they went home. Uh, the same roads that Napoleon had traveled, but in the opposite direction. And that was well after the Soviet Union had collapsed. It's very significant. You know, World War II in East Asia is not over. One of the things that Professor Torpy alluded to, you know, the China-Japan relationship and who's responsible for what in East Asia. The Cold War is not over in East Asia either if you've been on the Korean Peninsula. And so, in many ways, the European story is a different story from the Asian story. But nonetheless, even though I think the situation in Asia is significantly complicated, uh, more so than, than we understand sometimes, winning the peace was a very big deal. The Korean War, the Vietnam War, all of that doesn't change the situation, even though there's terrible tragedy involved in a lot of that stuff. And the Soviet side uh, lost the war in many ways, uh, materially, even though they won the victory. But more importantly, as I said earlier, they lost the peace. But the war is still the most immediate uh, uh, aspect of Russian history and Russian culture today. The way that the war is not central to America or not central to Europe is completely central to today's Russia. It is the most central aspect. There's no question. And it could well remain that way for a long time going forward. You know, we forget that the World War II commemorations in the Soviet Union, the Victory Day parade uh, repetitions, not the original one, and the memoirs and the kind of memorialization of World War II, those are brezhnev era phenomenon. That stuff started uh, after Khrushchev was taken down and Brezhnev came to power. And it was a way to fill the hole, the de-Stalinization hole that Khrushchev had opened up. And that hole is still there, and they filled that hole with this war. Uh, but they lost the peace, and it's a very complicated attempt to fill with that. 
And so in many ways, the fact that we've left it behind is not necessarily a bad thing in the United States. The fact that we have assimilated it is a testament in some odd way to the fact that we won the peace, even if it was a messy uh, victory of winning the peace. And the Russians have a much more complicated relationship in part because of what the war meant to them, uh, but also in part because of where they are today. Uh, but the East Asia stuff is a separate story and we really can't I'll go further into that, but I thank you for the opportunity today, and I thank the panelists also. Let me thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking them for their thoughtful and good. You're writing or is it in the book? Fear, 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 fear itself. itself. Yeah. It came out really well. They were very eloquent. I just, you don't have to pull this. It's connected. Oh. Just put it down on the table. Oh, Follow up with Professor Cass Nelson said describing describing post war regimes as being left wing new I don't know why. Sort of probing as to what he meant by that. The immediate post war. 
This will be a little bit more on the end. Well, I was curious about the way he brought it up, just in terms of making a distinction between new dealism and sort of, you know, poor European social democracy. I don't know if you're going to make that distinction. Right, but I just, I mean, yes, and that I think is I think. Yes. Yeah. Talk well. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we are. That was yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Sorry. What? Oh, no, no, no. 